It's hard to believe, but surfing started here just after it began in California. The generations of surfers go all the way back to the 60s. Surfing back then was surfing. That, you know, if you wanted to surf, you had to be really hardcore. I mean, you had to surf basically naked, wearing your little, like, black O'Neill wetsuit with a zipper down the front and a little, uh, you know, floppy beaver tail. That's all they had. Jim Sadler was, you know, I mean, he's history. As far as surfing goes in Tofino, that's it. And uh, when I started surfing, Harold and Kenny, Jim's sons, were the ones that were surfing. At the same time, if we were ever working on the job with them, and he turned around and said, oh, geez, surf's good, guys, let's go. Well, that was it, we're gone. Yeah. <laughs> he fell off a roof in uh, Victoria on a church that he was building and rode a sheet of plywood down to the ground. The, the plywood shot stories. off the scaffolding, and he, he floated it down like that, like a surfboard, <laughs> right to the ground, and then walked off. He did all the surfing with no leash. So every time he lost oh, the but, board, he had to swim to shore. They call me Jim Sadler. They called me Jim Paddler. But ready to go, you just go like this. Now you could paddle so fast. And I could go way out into the ocean. You saw me doing that going out there and catch huge waves. They'd come all the way in, and when they would go over like that, I could go underneath, underneath those things. And, oh, it was marvelous that you could never get wet at all. Jim Sadler built my dad's house down there. With my dad, they designed it and built it together. Uh, certainly, we all looked up to Jim Sadler as the innovator, the first guy to really surf out here, and the guy who went further with it than anybody else. He surfed under more radical conditions. He told me the story of his first board. He told me about how he, he saw it, a picture of a surfboard in a magazine, so he bought some styrofoam and shaped it, and then he mixed up some resin and laid out the fiberglass and put the resin on and the styrofoam immediately melted, which is what happens when you put resin on styrofoam. He kept falling off because he couldn't figure out and it was too slippery. And so he went back and read the magazine and read something about wax. So he thought, first you put the wax on the bottom of the board and that didn't work. <laughs> so then he came back in and looked at it again and put wax on the top of the board and then it finally worked yeah. and he was very pleased. In the later days of Jim Sadler's surfing, I recall uh, hearing the whine of a little engine up in the sky. I was really hoping that it wouldn't come to that. No. <laughs> well, when he discovered he could put an engine on the back of a hang glider, well, that, that yeah. changed everything. And I would look up and see this ultralight plane, and there would be Jim Sadler heading up to some secret beach up north with his surfboard strapped onto this little uh, ultralight plane. This thing. Yeah, the board. And, yeah. and then tied it on my ultralight and flew it all the way up and yeah. onto Chester and Beach over there. Right. And he was the only guy who ever did that. I think he did it until he crashed one day in the bushes over by the Long Beach Airport. Oh, for five years to there. be able to fly that thing for five years. Yeah. Oh, it was a marvelous thing. Nobody else could have ever had a better ultralight than I had. <laughs> And very, I can still well. tell everybody that my dad was a surfing champion of Canada for two That's years. Right. So. <laughs> and at, at that time, the surf club that organized the contests were from Jordan River. The Jordan River Surf Club are the old boys of surfing around here. They saw what surfing in Canada was, isolated, undiscovered, and they were determined to protect it. Well, we've had a reputation in the surf club for years of being non-welcoming, uh, mean-spirited, hard-hearted, uh, non-sharing locals and we fostered that impression we wanted people to think that and when other people were there we wouldn't say hello we wouldn't help them we wouldn't never let them in the sauna if they came on our property we kicked them off we there was it was just a no friendliness attitude in the 70s those were probably the golden years and back then it was totally pristine so that there was no pollution there was no crowd there was it was just like fun in the sun the soul part of it sort of came and went with the idea being that that was your focus, was to ride the waves rather than to be famous or make money or get girls or because it was the in thing to do. The idea of somebody putting on a dive suit and going out and riding a plank to the beach in British Columbia waters where it's gray and cold and wet all the time generally and to focus your entire life on, on riding waves. To me, that was the era of soul surfing. We were shaking our heads going, why isn't anybody else picking up on this? Surf magazines, 
Jan and Dean, the Beach Boys, that whole Southern California, blonde haired, sandals, shorts, everybody hanging around the beach, Gidget and all that stuff on TV contributed in a big way to it. And that's that whole beach bum thing really took off to the extent that it's a worldwide phenomenon now as part of the board culture. Basically three groups of people. Uh, there was the local high school kids who some of them went on to college or some of them became blue collar workers. And say out of 20 people or 30 people who would, you'd ever see surfing in a year, um, maybe five guys were draft dodgers. Then there were the hippies, um, as we called them, we called them moles. There were people living down at Sombrio Beach, but uh, there was quite a community down there. I mean, they had good houses, lots of plastic, and good firewood, but uh, I couldn't do it. So my hat's off to them. There's no signs to this beach. Yeah, this is the reason I don't take my truck. We got potholes. Up until a few years ago, this place was home to a community of squatters. Woof, woof. People like Rivermouth Mike lived down here for almost two decades. They came to live an alternative life and to surf. For them, this was a paradise, a place beyond the controls of society. But that's all changed. Okay, says. Named in June 1790, Sub-Lieutenant Manuel Quimper of the Spanish Navy, named for the dark and shady Sombrio appearance of the place. There was about 30 cabins. Every 100 yards there was one. Here's where the house was, and here there's, there's rocks underneath the floor. And my bedroom was here. I looked at it. I could roll over in bed and see the brakes. Or I could sit at the back of the house and look straight ahead. And with just turning my eyes, I could see all the brakes on Sombrio Beach. There was people there before me, but it was transient more. And the cabins were, you'd stay for a week or two, and then you'd bring in enough supplies to eat, and then you leave and you make your living and come back when you get a chance. You know, and the, the cabins were shared. It was pretty good spiritual feeling, too. We're happy with the surf, enough to make you stay. That's why we stayed so long. In my home, I like a little privacy. Your house turned into a locker room. I didn't really regret leaving. It's time to go. Here's what the, the, the cabin was in here, Barb and Steve's. See, here's a fireplace. Yeah. Barbara built it. The only concrete thing on the beach. For the archaeologist to ponder. It was a simple way of life. Like on the beach, it was like the biggest sandbox in the world. That's just where I was. It wasn't a philosophy. Mm -hmm. It's just where life took me. Steve and Barb raised 11 kids on that beach over the course of 16 years. Living off the land, no amenities, and like the Brewweilers, the entire family grew up surfing and produced a few prodigies, like Isaiah, Leia, and Jesse. There was people living down here a long time before we ever moved here. Like, just like, basically like in the 60s and 70s, you know, just like, you're basically hippies, just checking out the woods, you know? Oh no, this isn't the house. The house was way bigger. The house was like three times this size. Oh really? Before, like, like, like where you're standing was, was part of the house. You know? They're like, telling me stories of some, some nights when the storms were so bad, they couldn't even stay in the cabin. They'd have to go sleep on the beach because they didn't trust the trees around them. The fact that they lived on the beach and they survived with what they could, and it was almost like homesteading. Yeah, cool family. I was happy to be a part of that. But nothing lasts forever. In 1996, the government declared the beach a provincial park. The squatters moved it. Thousands of kilograms of what most people would call junk has to go. It's all that's left of most of the tiny shacks that former Sombrio Beach squatters pieced together over the years. I mean, I 
had an eight-month-old baby, I took my house apart and carried half of it up the trail. And of course, it's hard to leave where you've been for 16 years and you don't really want to go. Just seeing the family growing up here and, and seeing their changes and seeing the way their life was being lived it was pretty healthy and pretty pretty free. They had to uproot themselves and move into a city style format with the house, a running running faucet, a toilet, TV, the whole nine yards, even a phone, like that was a big change for them. Why do we have to live in a little box on a little street? <laughs> I don't know, I didn't make the rules. It's okay to leave. Road access, it's so crowded, people are just gonna keep coming. Now I have to come like everybody else. Eh? I have to come down by the tides when it's good. I used to enjoy the sunsets. Sombrio wasn't the same without the squatters, and they weren't the same without Sombrio. Within two years of moving away from that beach, a series of tragedies struck the Elk family. It all happened in 2000. They all died within three months. Um, they're all single car accidents. Yeah, that wouldn't happen if we were on the beach, though, for sure. Three deaths in the family within a period of three months. Clearlight, Dawn, and then Jesse. Jesse was going to be, I think, our uh, our big wave king surfer. You know, like before he died, we were talking about you know him going to surf Mavericks or YMA or something. Jesse Oak had the most balls I've ever seen. He wasn't scared of anything. You know, he made me want to charge harder and you know surf bigger waves. I knew him his whole life. And uh, he gave me a hug just before he died. <laughs> For 22-year-old Jesse Oak, early Sunday morning, his truck plunged off the end of the slippery dock. An hour later, his body was pulled from the frigid waters. I was the guy that got the call to go pull him out. And I'm glad it was, I'm glad it was me and not somebody who didn't know him and there was two other people in the truck, and I'm glad it wasn't three trips down that I had to do. Hit his head, I guess, somewhere on, in the vehicle, and two other people that were with him couldn't get him out, because Jesse was a big, heavy guy, you know? He wasn't a small guy. He was a big guy. They couldn't get him out. You know, I started thinking, I go, you know, what better way to, you know, celebrate Jesse's life, which was centered around surfing, to, you know, celebrate his life and his memory than to have basically all the surfers come together and a contest in memory of, uh, of Jesse. It was amazing, you know, it was end of February, uh, the whole week leading up to the event was gray, drizzly, stormy. Raph ended up winning it. Yeah, yeah, I don't think I Seth actually made the finals. Yeah. He was in, you know, on, a, on equipment that was a little too small for the conditions. And I know, I know he would have really wanted to win that one for Jesse. And I think he was really, really disappointed in himself. Uh, you know, we all suffered a major loss last weekend. Uh, Jesse passed away, and um, I still don't believe it. I'm sure most of us don't. I hope we can do this an annual thing, you know, keep the memory alive. And representing Canada again for the fourth time. Yeah. <laughs> this win goes out to Jesse Oak. The surfing community is to this day devastated by the tragedies of the Oak family. For the surfers who experienced the way of life at Sombrio Beach, it marked the uh, end of an era. For Jesse, we cherished as an agate, we were honored. Your presence keeps living within the sea and upon the land. Thank you for the love and lessons.